Welcome to In the Margins. I'm your host, Ralph Newell. We are doing a series on the examples of Excellencia for 2024. For those in the audience not familiar with the examples of Excellencia, it is the only national data-driven effort to recognize programs at the associate, baccalaureate, graduate, as well as community-based organizations um, with evidence of effectiveness evidence of effectiveness in accelerating Latino student success. For 2024, 103 programs were nominated from 20 different states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, for incorporating intentional and culturally relevant evidence-based practices that positively impact um, Latino students. For the community-based organizational level, the Emakali Foundation was recognized as the 2024 example of excellencia for career pathways, empowering students to succeed. And with us today, we have Noemi Perez, the president and CEO of the Immokalee Foundation. Congratulations to you all and welcome. Thank you, honored to be here. Thank you. You know, I just wanna give just a few stats here. The program, you guys' program has shown significant impact on the success of Latino students uh, in your area. It says here, Career Pathways Service served 84%, 84% of the students you served this past year are of Latino descent. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanna give the group a um, couple of numbers here. Post high school graduation plan, 100% of Latino students graduate from high school and enter a college program um, and get a job in the career field or the, the other choice or the military. 100% of the Latino students, eighth grade students and up you work with um, develop career plans. You have 100% of high school students receive industry certifications. I'm just saying this stuff at a very high level. Mm -hmm. And you have 93% um, of your graduates, of your program graduate from college, surpassing the national, average, national study average. So these are all phenomenal numbers. I mean, they can go to the Excellencia website, uh, your website, I'm sure, to get more of this information. Um, you guys are definitely to be commended for that. But I think for us to understand how you got there, um, I think we got to go back a little bit. So if you can tell us, uh, first of all, Immokalee, Florida is not exactly a name that um, I think most people in the country know at all, if at all. So if you could let us know about the history of this community and 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 the demographics and what's going on there. Sure, be happy to. Amakli is a small agricultural community. Um, we are uh, about 45 minutes away from Naples, Florida, which is a very uh, affluent and beautiful community. Majority of the population in Amakli come from other countries. So it's, it's a migrant um, community. Many families work in agricultural. So in um, produce, you know, picking in the fields, tomatoes and other uh, vegetables that are grown nearby. Many of the families, you know, want the best for their, their students. They come here to this country for a better life, better opportunity. Um, so many of them do not have a high education. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the parents, you know, may not have completed uh, even middle school. So uh, they go straight into uh, the workforce. And so many of those families are very appreciative of what the foundation provides and who we are. We yeah. have about, I would say, 35,000 residents within the uh, Mockley community um, out of season. And then in season, that'll fluctuate to about, you know, 40 to 45,000 residents who come in just depending on, on um, the crops and what they're producing. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I myself uh, was I was raised and born in Immokalee, so uh, it's a an honor to lead an organization that comes in and provides um, this education for the, the students and the families. OK, no, very interesting. So the foundation itself, um, when did that get started and, and why? So this month, actually, we're celebrating our 33 uh, year uh, okay. in existence. We, our founder, uh, Parker Collier, really believed, you know, came out and visited the community and saw the poverty that was happening. And of course, as we all believe, you know, education breaks the cycle of poverty, right? So she gathered community leaders together and founded the Immokalee Foundation. We started off as a foundation that provided many grants to other organizations within that focus on education. 
Mm -hmm. And so um, had success with that. And about 2001, the board came together and said, you know, from an assessment that they had uh, read, there was more need within the community for um, after school programming that focused on certain topics. And so with that, they started, they shifted to um, not providing the small grants and shifted more to uh, your in your direct in-service uh, programming. So we serve about 1,300 students a year, ranging from kindergarten all the way through post-secondary. So in our elementary level, from kindergarten to fifth grade, we provide after-school literacy intervention for those students. Mm -hmm. We focus and target on the students who uh, need to be um, at grade level. And so we work very closely with the principals, the teachers within the school to identify those students. Um, every year, we roughly provide um, services to about 800 students within the elementary level. In middle school, we start our Career Pathways program. Um, and so those students are uh, apply to our program. Um, and in those grade areas, we really focus on career readiness and providing the research and the background to these different careers. Before I go into that program, I want to kind of step back and talk about mm -hmm. why we shifted and why we really focus more on that career readiness. So previous to this, um, our focus was really more eighth grade, ninth, 10th, and 11th grade, and then post-secondary. Mm -hmm. And it was more geared towards um, college preparatory. Because years ago, you know, everyone was saying, you know, you have to go to college, you have to, you know, go to university, you, you need that degree in order to be successful. And that was about, I would say, 12 years ago, right, where the focus yeah. was really pushing that. And so, you know, as a foundation with, we're very data driven and looking at that data, we identified that. And so we really pushed our students into more of a college, um, college bound track. Mm -hmm. And so in receiving that data, um, every summer we survey our alum and we receive the data and looking at 40% of our alum were not working in their field of study. So mm -hmm. you read our stats, right? 100% mm -hmm. graduate from high school, 100% go into a post-secondary program, 93 graduate from a post-secondary with a degree. Right. But what was happening after that, right? Mm -hmm. Where were our students going? Uh, because that's where you really measure the success. What career are they going into? Is it is it um, aligning with the major that they uh, of their degree? Right. So we took that data. We also looked at, um, we went further and really looked at the workforce around Southwest Florida. Because from that survey, we also identified that many of our students wanted to return to this community to work here, mm -hmm. to live here. And so taking that, we uh, looked at research, workforce um, data research. We spoke to different business leaders around the community. We spoke to our school district, the leadership there. We spoke to the different presidents within the different institutions that were around our community and really asked different questions about how we can better prepare the students. Mm -hmm. um, and so gathering all of, all of that information, we created what we call today Career Pathways. And in identifying the research, we also saw that we had to start very early in providing this curriculum and instruction to our students. So hence, we start off in sixth grade. When you said that, we did um, at Diverse some research for, I think it was the um, ASHA, the American Speech and Hearing and Language Association, um, mm -hmm. probably about 10 years ago. And they were trying to increase the pipeline of people of color in that field because so many of the people that they service are of color in this country, but the practitioners were primarily female and primarily um, white. So mm -hmm. they wanted to get more people of color. And so when we did this research, we found that they couldn't start talking to these kids in college or high school. They actually had to start in middle school. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you just said the same thing. And so um, I was going to ask you, how did you come to that conclusion? Like, what did you see that said, we've got to start in middle school and that high school in some regards is sometimes too late? 
You know, I think it was through trial and error of our own, right? As I mentioned, we started, you know, eighth grade really mm -hmm. working with our students and then gathering the data um, and then speaking to professionals within the education sector and really mm -hmm. asking them, you know, what would be the best, the best route to take at this point. So it was, it again, it was more of the listening, mm -hmm. right? And, and really gathering that information from others to make that conclusion. The district at that moment, when we spoke to the superintendent, that was one of the things that she was trying to focus on as well, was trying to implement a, a middle school sort of career readiness um, initiative. Right. And so when we brought this to her, she actually said to me, you, wow, you have, you've nailed it. You mm -hmm. might, you, you figured it out, you know, for us. And so through the research and really looking at the workforce demands here in our area, we identified four, er four career pathways. Okay. The first one was um, healthcare. Well, that's not a surprise, right? right. Um, we live in, in an area where we have a lot of seasonal retirees, mm -hmm. um, but healthcare is just, you know, there's a huge need for a lot of um, these types of uh, uh, positions to be filled. The second was education and human services. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our school district, our government um, offices are the areas that have a huge need for, um, for hiring individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, the third was business management entrepreneurship. So our area doesn't have a lot of Fortune 500 companies, but what right. we do have are a lot of small businesses. Mm -hmm. And so um, really focusing on that as well. And then the fourth uh, may not be a surprise, but engineering and construction management. So mm -hmm. looking at, you know, not only our area, but other areas as well, we're growing, more people are coming here. There's more of an opportunity for that. The other side of that was also looking at the different generations. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of baby boomers who are retiring. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the businesses we're talking about, we're losing a lot of the, we're going to lose a lot of the historical knowledge, the experience, the skills. Um, and so they were really looking at, you know, how could we fill that gap? And so in taking these four career pathways, we created a curriculum. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, we start off in sixth grade. So sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, our students are exposed. They're doing research. They have some hands-on projects. Um, so by eighth grade, our students are identifying, uh, they're creating their own, what we call career action plan. Mm -hmm. This career action plan ask them different questions about um, their interest, mm -hmm. the research that they did, what, you know, we do aptitude testing as well, you know, uh, based on your interests, you know, you align with this career pathway. Um, so by the end of their eighth grade year, they're identifying which career pathway they're going to uh, commit to. So it's not, it's not a profession. We're not asking them at eighth grade to, uh, commit to becoming a surgeon, right? Right, right. What we're asking is based on all of this research, these these different exercises that you've been a part of, what at the end, what aligns, what best aligns with your interest? And so at that point, they are filling out this career action plan. They are also identifying which courses to take in high school mm -hmm. because our high school also has different career academies and dual enrollment opportunities. So they're they're researching all of this and they're, they're, they're um, writing out their plan. And then they, we go as far as even post-secondary. So mm -hmm. based on this career, um, which post-secondary school is best aligned, you know, with this career or this uh, pathway you want to go into. And so that starts the process to get them thinking. Um, they present this to their parents. They present this to their student advocate because all of them have a student advocate um, that's part of our staff. We also have a career counselor on staff. So they, he's, he's in the room. And then our students also have mentors. So mm -hmm. the mentor is also in the room. Why? Um, quick question though, uh -huh. uh, I'm gonna go back. So those four buckets, those four career buckets, when you are giving them their recommendations, is it within one of those four buckets or is it broader than that? So we are not giving recommendations. They are mm -hmm. selecting. 
So they're selecting based on the research that they've done, the information mm -hmm. they've received, what, where they would like to continue to uh, explore. Right. So okay. not necessarily, you know, many of them um, can will say, well, you know, I really like healthcare. I mm -hmm. think that at some point, maybe I could become a nurse. Maybe I could become a uh, some type of tech, you know, within the medical field. Um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. paramedic. They they just start to start thinking about different careers that are within. So right. they're really just committing to a pathway to continue gotcha. to further their interest and explore. Gotcha. Okay. So. The reason why this this meeting is important, um, as I mentioned, it's because we want to make sure that we're not identifying that mm -hmm. pathway for the student. Right. We want to we make sure it's their decision. And quite honestly, this is the first time that their parents are hearing about the interests from their student. So our community, mm -hmm. as I mentioned to you and, and described it, our parents don't have the although they would want to, they don't have the opportunity to sit and have dinner and have these conversations, right? right. They're on survival mode. Mm -hmm. And so these meetings are so, um, they, they, they're they so impactful. Uh, many times we have a lot of tears coming from the parents uh, because it's the first time they're hearing that mm -hmm. their student is passionate about this area. That's wonderful. So yeah. once they go into high school, we have um, an after school program. Uh, so our middle school program, it is an after school program three days a week. And then in high school, it turns into one day a week where they really hone in on that career pathway that they've selected. Mm -hmm. uh, they also begin working on certifications. So uh, any, you know, all of our pathways have different certifications that they can start working towards. And so by junior year, they are uh, also responsible to complete 120 hours of an internship in the summer. Mm -hmm. Why this is important is, as you know, experience, right? right. On right. the job training. So mm -hmm. my staff does a phenomenal job uh, collaborating with different businesses around um, the community to provide this opportunity for the students. So once the student identifies uh, the area of interest, so by junior year, a lot of the students know, okay, physical therapy, I'm interested in that. Mm -hmm. Our staff works with um, the businesses to acquire a uh, internship opportunity for the student. Student goes in, completes 120 hours, comes out of it, either passionate about it or tells mm -hmm. us. <laughs> Not for me. Right. You know? And so at that point, our career counselor starts to work with them and says, okay, well, um, you know, maybe the, you love the medical field, but you can't see blood. So, but there's other opportunities within, you know, healthcare. So right. let's explore that. Let's talk about that. We, uh, <laughs> we think that it's very important for the student to, to identify this in high school right. versus in college where they're spending time and money and, you know, and then they're, they're just, you know, trying still to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So once senior year comes in, you know, our students are working on applying to those post-secondary schools that best align with their interest, um, scholarships. And so by the time they graduate, not only do they graduate with a high school diploma, but they're graduating with um, certifications uh, within their field which opens up opportunities for them, right? So we wanted to make sure that our, our kids, you know, if they're not contributing financially to the household, that's a problem, that's a challenge for them. So mm -hmm. we needed to make sure that, you know, the internships are paid, right. um, you know, we're providing stipends in our after school program, um, all of these different uh, barriers in mm -hmm. order for them to, make sure that they take care or they take a part of, of this opportunity we're giving them. So fast forward, uh, this career pathway started about seven years ago. And so I shared the data, right? 40% mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are not working in their field of study, which means 60% were. Last year when we pulled this, this data, 87% um, of our alum are now working in their field of study. 
Okay. So because of all of these different intentional uh, practices that we've um, created and we've implemented, it's starting to move the needle for our kids. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. also created some great, great, strong partnerships, not only with the local institution, Florida Gulf Coast University, yeah. um, but other businesses. So I wanted to share an example. Okay. In our engineering and construction management, we uh, when we started to talk about internships, we kind of hit a snag because we said, well, do we really trust 16 year olds running around a construction site, right? Uh, okay. I don't have enough staff to you know, follow them around. Um, the responsibility would be on the company. You know, do we do we really trust that? Um, so it was it was a little it was difficult trying to figure out what we would do there. At the time, or we still do have a strong relationship with the, with the general contractor, which is BCB Homes. We had a strong relationship with the district. Um, did they hold up? Did 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 they end up using the students? Yes. So okay. No, I, I was going to say an, I can raise my hand. Yeah, an innovative way that we kind of created something. No, so, my father was a general contractor. He owned his own firm. And I started working for him literally at the age of 11, 12. Yeah, I believe So that. I was like, they could have gotten something. So good. <laughs> so um, at the time, we had a board member that was a, a, in business for real estate. Um, and just so happened that the mm -hmm. founder that founded the Immokalee Foundation also owned that company. Mm -hmm. So he went to ask for a piece of property because the big idea was for us to build a home in Amakini, right? We right. wanted to one home so that we could give them the the, the training, hands-on, all of that. He came back and said, You're, um, we will give you eight acres of property. Mm -hmm. You can build 18 homes. And BCB Home said, wonderful, we're on board. We will get the subcontractors to dedicate their time in order to teach the students. Mm -hmm. So that happened four years ago. We are on the 11th home, 11, 12, and 13th home that we're working on. Uh, okay. They're built by the students for the community. Mm -hmm. So one of the other challenges Immokalee has is we have a lot of affordable housing, mm -hmm. but we didn't have middle-class housing for your teachers, your first right. responders, all of these other professions, right? Mm -hmm. So this, um, you know, helped with that community. Right. So it's built by the students and it's so to the community. So um, we have, you know, different uh, residents that live in that community now. Uh, and it's just, it's just so great to see. Um, but from that, we've been able to create similar uh, programs in mm -hmm. other with other organizations uh, like our local sheriff's office, we created a six week 911 dispatching program for our students where students go through that program, get certified, and then the sheriff's office hires them right, you know, right as they complete it. So it's um it's very exciting for us because you know we are we want to be the the bridge not only for the student success, but also for the community and meeting the needs of this workforce demand. Yeah, no, that is awesome, really. So I, I'm sitting here thinking, I, I'm, I'm still looking at, I wrote down your healthcare, education, human services, business management, construction. Um, what about, I mean, right now, currently it, you know, it's an agricultural community with the, um, you're talking about the, the, a lot of the labor with the um, produce farms. What about agribusiness? Is that um, one of the areas you guys look at? So in our research, um, it's not one of the high trends okay. uh, right now. Um, it's actually uh, dying off. Um, not so many people are going into that uh, career. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our families, you know, that came here that we're working in the fields um, has transitioned into construction, landscape, okay. um, hospitality as mm -hmm. well. So because it's hard, yeah. it's a hard job, and it's hard too on on the families when you're having to you know commute when you're having to travel. Um, you know our students at times would have to enroll into about three to four schools because you know the families had to follow you know, the crops and, and mm -hmm. where they were harvesting. So there's been a shift. 
you know, if a student has a dire, you know, interest and passion for it, of course, you know, we will, uh, we will find that opportunity for them, but it's not something that is, um, that I would say, you know, in demand right now. Right, right. Yes. And I, and I definitely was not thinking of them being labor, you know, the horticulturalists, the, you know, there's logistics with it. There's a business side of it. There's just so much in that industry that, you know, that's beyond just, you know, the labor that you need. So right. that's, that's more where I was thinking. Yeah. Um, no, this is, you know, I, I probably had like 20 questions written down and you've already answered like 15 <laughs> and, and just what you're talking about. But I, I want to go back to, you know, kindergarten. How is it that you guys um, identify the students in the program or is it well, yeah, well, I'll just let you answer that. Let me not yeah. expect it. So we um, hire certified teachers that work within the school day in our after school program. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lead teacher for all of all of the schools. We're in all five schools uh, in Immokalee and mm -hmm. they work closely with the principal. So okay. they review the data. They identify the student, um, which is very helpful for us. And then that's when our, our staff starts to work with them. Um, we hire the certified teachers, and then we also hire our after school tutors to mm -hmm. help uh, with give the instruction and tutor the students as well. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, our students who are part of the education and, and human services pathway, mm -hmm. uh, this would be considered or looked at their academic year internship because okay. working on site in the school, working alongside the teacher, working with the students. Um, and we've had phenomenal uh, stats there. 97% uh, of our students um, in that program make uh, a significant gain, um, mm -hmm. which, could, which could mean, you know, they come into our program reading at a first grade level, and then some of them will jump. If they're in third grade, they'll jump to, you know, at grade level or beyond. Um, it's just, it's a phenomenal program. Yeah. So is it also need base? Only? Uh, well, you know, it? yes and no. Need base. Uh, so all of our services are free. Right. Charge. Right. It's more identified our elementary uh, program, which is we call it Immokalee Readers. It's, mm -hmm. it's more based on the need as far as the student growth and mm -hmm. where they are at their level. We don't look at you know, um, income base or anything like that for them to okay. be part of that program. Yeah. So you've got your, your people, your boots on the ground that are identifying students. So what if I'm a parent who says, man, this looks like something that would be good for my student. Can they apply or register to, to yes. jump in? They have yes, to of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, they can. Um, and it's dependent, you know, on our, on the spots available. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the times, you know, we we may have to put them on a waiting list. You know, some of the times, you know, we'll bring them in later on. But right. we do our best to accommodate um, and to provide the services as best as we can. Um, it's just it's hard, you know, in a community, mm -hmm. where, you know, a lot of although it's free to our families, you know, we have to fundraise on this end. And so there's a huge need in Immokalee, I will say, uh, for us to expand. Um mm -hmm. But of course, that's tied to funding, as as you're aware. Yeah. So I think you kind of just answered what I was just thinking about. You got the ones that are starting at K K five. So, at what point, or is there a point where it's too late for a student to to join? Um, in our elementary level. No, I just meant to so I mean, overall. Uh, all, all overall. So like. You know, if you're now a high school freshman. Is it okay? Yeah. Well, oh, you kind of well, so, we do know. have opportunities. So some of the times we'll have spots available, depending on you know if a student for whatever reason has to move, mm -hmm. um, we have spots available. Um, all of our students, you know, commit to our program, so they have to adhere to uh, 2.5 GPA. Um, okay. You know, they they have to meet with their mentor if they have one. Stay drug and crime free. Volunteer in the community. And then exhibit good behavior in and out of school. So those are five things that they commit to every year. Okay. Uh, and so if you know if a student for whatever reason can adhere to that, or you know there's there's situations like that. So we do have spots available where um, students can apply um, in their ninth grade uh, all the way up to their senior year. 
it's mm-hmm. just a little bit more difficult, you know, because you have to kind of go through a sort of a fast pace right, right. <laughs> of a career pathways curriculum. Um, but we have had, you know, d- uh, situations like that. Mm-hmm. So you, you said earlier that a number or I got the impression the majority of the students who are in the program have the desire to come back there to to live and work. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have numbers so far on what percentage of them are able to come back? I do not. Okay. Uh, that is something that we are measuring now, now that it's an area of focus. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say that we have a large percentage of um, our alum that not only want to come back, but they want to give back in some way. Um, so that's very, that's really important to us because we want mm-hmm. to make sure that, you know, at some point they, they want to volunteer with us or another organization or come and speak to our students, right? Because right. that's important. They, uh, as you know, it's, it's, it's helpful whenever you have someone in front of you that you can relate to that mm-hmm. has the same background that, you know, is successful now and you can see yourself in, in their eyes. So it, it is a, you know, through the survey, it was, a, it was very apparent to us that many of them wanted to come back. Mockley is a very tight knit faith-based community. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, you work with, with Hispanic population and we're very close to our family. So mm-hmm. we want to be, you know, near and, you know, near to them. Um, and so that, that drives our students. They they want to come back and help in not only the community but with their with their household as well. Yeah, well, you you're kind of talking about yourself because didn't I read that you you once were a student advocate yourself in the program? I started off as student advocate. Um, actually celebrating 16 years uh, here with the foundation. I always had a heart, you know, a desire to come back and serve my community in some way. It wasn't I wasn't at that point. I didn't know how. I didn't know what. Mm-hmm. I was raised in the church, so my parents were pastors, so I, I oh. was able mm-hmm. to see firsthand the spirit of serving, mm-hmm. and so I think that was instilled in me at a very young age, and yeah, so I came in 2008, worked with the students, fell in love with it, you know, and I never thought, you know, I would because I was terrified of teenagers, you know, um, it's hard, you know, working with them, but sharing my story, um, seeing that they, you know, they wanted to aspire, they had dreams and that mm-hmm. really motivated me that I went and I completed my own, you know, degree while I was working here at the foundation, because it was such an inspiration to me. And so I am very fortunate. I'm in my sixth year of being the president and CEO of this wonderful organization. And I've been able to see growth and change. And I've been able to be a part of the change and the um, the innovative work that we're doing. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's definitely God's work, uh, yeah. I would say, that I'm doing. Absolutely. I, I think I saw somewhere else. Um, I'm not sure if you said it or someone I'm quoting someone else who who described you as a second mother to these students. Uh-huh. What do you say about that? How do you feel? Uh, I, I think that's true. You know, mm-hmm. I love them and I, I will fight for them, you know, and we have a graduation ceremony every year. And it's just it's very emotional for me because I am one of them. Right. Mm-hmm. I see myself mm-hmm. and all of them in their eyes. And, and when I meet with the parents and I talk to them and how grateful they are you know, a simple thank you. And they're so humbled and, and all they want, right. Is opportunity. That's what I tell mm-hmm. everyone. Mm-hmm. Our kids, all they want is an opportunity, give them an opportunity and they're going to soar and, and they have. And so it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's that uh, if I could bring in every student in a mock to, you know, to serve and to do what we do, I would do it right, right. <laughs> hands down. Okay, so I think we have a, a a very good understanding of at a high level of you know what you provide for the students, the the, the career pathways that you set them on, the academic support and thing like that. But you know, I think we talked about I mentioned earlier, but sometimes life gets in the way. Um, you're talking about how some of these kids have to provide income to the family. How? What other services do you guys provide if you do at all for the students outside of you know, the academic and career prep. One of the things that I, 
pride on as well, apart from the success that we have with our students, is mm -hmm. the power of collaboration. Mm -hmm. We have been able to collaborate on so many different levels, um, not just with our Career Pathways program, but with other resources, other organizations. Um, and so as an example, when COVID happened, mm -hmm. we were still, you know, we, we remain open. We were providing services online because one of the things that was important to me was we had to stay consistent in the lives of our students, right? Everything mm -hmm. else was going crazy. No one knew what was gonna happen. But we had to be present, even if it was through video. And so through that, we quickly saw, and the parents quickly saw, there were challenges with mental health. Mm -hmm. And they were calling my staff and describing, you know, my child, something's different you know, now, because now they're, they're home all day, right? Mm -hmm. The kids were able to mask it with different activities and busy life. And so through that, I connected with the local um, institution, Florida Gulf Coast University, mm -hmm. and started to have these conversations about mental health and services. And my first challenge was changing the mindset of our parents, because it's a bad stigma. Uh, mental health counseling, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's looked upon in a bad way. And so how do we educate the families to be okay with this? And so that was I knew, one of my first challenges. But aside from that, how do we bring mental health services to our kids, especially our post-secondary students? So fast forward, we were able to come to an agreement where the students who are in their master's program at the uh, uh, community uh, mental health counseling over at Florida Gulf Coast University. They have a clinical supervisor that supervises them, but these students come and they provide services to our students at our site. One of the other challenges I saw was we can't send our students to another office or, you know, another site because they're not going to trust them. Our mm -hmm. foundation is a trusted organization. They trust us. Um, we're in our third year. They come to our office, they provide these mental health uh, services to our students, um, even beyond to their families and even to my staff, mm -hmm. because my staff also carries a lot too, you know, uh, hearing all these stories. So that has been so successful, but that's, you know, just an example of the different things that we do in order to try to kind of provide that holistic, right? serve, you know, the holistic services to our students, you know, if they, if they talk about a need for meals. You know, we have an organization that we can connect to. So okay. beyond the academics, right, we also mm -hmm. are a connector for other sources um, because it takes that time with our student for them to open up and to okay. share, you know, what's really happening. And so, yeah, I mean, we've just, we have such a great reputation in the community and, you know, everywhere we go, it's, it's, how can we connect so that we can provide, you know, uh, a better service for our students and families? Yeah. Gosh, that, that connecting part, it was, I, I left this on the table. So I kind of want to go back. We were talking about the internships and things like that and the career paths for, for, the, for the students. How do you work with the, the students who are choosing um, career paths or fields of study that, is outside of your norm. When I say your norm, I mean, it's like there were there opportunities within your metro area. Like if they're looking at a career that, I don't know, maybe the closest company that does it is in Georgia. How do you facilitate that? Or have you not had that? Um, so I think we are very unique where almost every career or every profession mm -hmm. that you can think of, we have around us here in okay. South Florida. Yeah. Um, but to answer your question, we have had students who, let's just say, they've gone through the career pathways, right? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we had one that said, I want to be a curator. So we're like, okay, we're going to connect with someone locally. Mm -hmm. And so we found an organization here, an arts uh, organization that um, opened up their doors and provided an internship for that student. And so we do have you know, some students who come to us and say, uh, you know, I 
I want to do something artistic, something mm -hmm. different that is not within. And, you know, we, again, what we do is provide the information and educate the student. At the end of the day, it's their choice because it's their life, right? It's their career. Mm -hmm. We just are mm -hmm. going to do the best we can to, to help them, you know, with, with finding, finding that path to uh, their success. Awesome. So tell us if you can, and I, you know, and I, and I think everybody who has come through their program is, is obviously a, a success, but do you have an anecdote or a story about a student or two that just, you know, I don't know, that just touches your heart that you want to share with us? Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. I have many, but I have one that always, always sticks out. So I started off as student advocate. I worked, you know, with the students and there was this, this young student that his family, uh, his father worked in construction. His mother didn't, didn't work. She was, um, she, you know, she was at home and, and just kind of provided for this, the, his siblings. Mm -hmm. And so he, in conversations with him, he said to me, I don't think I can go to college. And I said, why? And he said, because I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So my response to him was, well, if I can find funding for you, would you still go? And he said, um, I don't know. So, you know, it, it took some time, you know, I met him, I think his like his freshman year. So it took some time, you know, for us to have conversations. Well, he was dual enrolled in one of the construction technical schools um, mm -hmm. that was nearby. And so he had a passion for construction. So, you know, different things I threw out and he gravitated towards engineer. This kid was smart. Mm -hmm. So I knew he could do it. It was just the, he needed someone to help kind of um, bloom, right? Mm -hmm. That thing that he had, he had it in him. And his parents were supportive and, you know, so kept working with him. Today, he graduated from Florida Gulf Coast University with, with his civil engineering degree. He is a civil engineer locally, um, works for a firm here. Okay. And what's cool about this is that we're currently working on a project and he's the lead civil engineer for this project, for the foundation. Great, great. So it's that, just that full circle. I was, oh, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> and, and it didn't stop with him. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about breaking the cycle of poverty, right? But we talk about the generational impact that yeah. this has as well. All of his siblings, his brother graduated with a bachelor's in, um, he's a golf pro, oh, um, really? works at a local uh, golf pro um, course, golf course. Mm -hmm. His other brother is currently in school. He's about to graduate with his marketing degree. He works for a local um, arena here that, you know, puts on shows and for their marketing department. Right, right. His little sister is currently at uh, um, Florida State University mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, uh, in medical, in, in healthcare. Okay. So they're all successful. And to me, that's what it's about, right? It's it's that one brother in this family just needed that extra push, you know, the the support, the mm -hmm. the fact that you you can do it, you know, believing in him, right? That he changed the the life of not only himself but of his other siblings and his entire family. Yeah, I was gonna say he changed the trajectory of his entire family. Um, so kudos to you for, for helping that in that way. Um, getting closer to the end of time. So, I mean, I think about that story you just shared. And so what what do you see in the future um, for the Career Pathways Program? Um, are you guys planning on expanding, you know, into any new career tracks? Or are you working to uh, replicate this other places? What's what's in the future? So, you know, for us, it's about um, focusing on the community of Immokalee mm -hmm. and uh, seeing what we can do to continue to serve uh, more students within our community. 
As far as the career pathways, we just did some research and it uh, looks like the four pathways that we currently have are going to you know, continue to be those four pathways that are in demand here locally. With adding some IT within all pathways, because IT is going to hit all different professions as we see in the future, yeah. especially with AI. So um, we have a partnership right now with uh, Market Microsoft. Um, they provided a grant, and so they're coming in uh, in in our middle school program and, and providing curriculum to the students. So we want to expand that into high school. As far as replicating, you know, I I will say that there is an opportunity for us to uh, work with other organizations who may be interested in learning more. Mm -hmm. it's, we live in an interesting community, and so maybe other organizations don't have the benefits that we do. Right. There's pieces and components uh, or best practices that we have that I know that could be implemented in other programs mm -hmm. um, to help uh, as well. So, you know, nothing's off the table. Um, but right now, you know, the what we're focusing on is, you know, making sure that we are uh, providing the education and the training for the students for all of these um, growth professions that are coming up, continuing to build strong partnerships with local businesses. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of work ahead of us and I'm just, I'm excited. Um, we'll complete our development that I just spoke to you about uh, here mm -hmm. in probably a year or two. So uh, yeah, I mean, right now we just finished our three-year strategic plan and we're going to start working on the next three years. And so I think, you know, for us, the sky's the limit. We're very yeah. innovative and we, um, you know, again, it's all about the success for our students. Yeah. No, thank you very much. And um, I asked that question about replicating other places because I have, you know, family that live in um, some very rural areas and everybody's goal is to get out, mm -hmm. um, go to college, get out, and but they have no intentions of coming back. Not because they don't like home, but there's just nothing there for them to do. Right. So I, I commend you guys for working with the, the local businesses um, and, and setting up these, um, you know, no pun intended, pathways for people to come back. So um, as we end, I'll give you an opportunity to say the last word. Um, if you want to share uh, anything else or at least provide information to our audience of how they could reach your organization if they have any questions or or want to help. Sure. They can definitely visit our website, immokaliefoundation.org. Um, that provides much more information. Um, they can certainly reach out to me. I mean, I'm more than happy to, to have a conversation, to start a conversation, um, talk a little bit more, uh, have, you know, more of a dialogue on, on, you know, what we do and how we do it. Um, but um, yeah, so, I mean, we're open to sharing our best practices with anyone. Okay. All right. Thank you, Noemi.